I'm Alex Lamb, Chief Exec of Lantern Rouge, and your host here today on The Real Work. He studied at the University of West Indies, where he gained a BSc in Sciences before moving on to complete postgrad diplomas in hotel management in Trinidad and Tobago, as well as international tourism in Salzburg, Austria. Throughout his career, he has been deeply embedded in theatre work, including production, stage management, lighting design. However, his early career was spent in banking and tourism. He has a wealth of experience in heritage, leisure, and the museums and gallery sectors, where he's been focused on creating teams and operational procedures for cultural institutions, including the Millennium Dome experience, Victoria and Albert Museum, one of my favourites, South Bank Centre, South Bank Centre, and most recently with the London Transport Museum. So it's a beautiful long bio for a beautiful, comprehensive career. So welcome, Vaughan. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. <laughs> Absolutely. I love your profile. You, <laughs> your study, your experience has traversed so many areas with banking yeah. and science, tourism, arts, etc. So yeah. what would you say are, I guess, some of the key moments in that career that led you to where you are today? I wish I could tell you it was a master plan. I knew <laughs> what I was going to study. I applied myself, applied to the right places, and from then on, it was the Disney version of everybody's life. But <laughs> as you know, it's, it's not that. And although, you know, you plan and you try to think about where you want to be, depending on your talents or your loves or your passions, it's just sometimes so random. It mm. is accidental meetings. It is... Uh, events that you can't control, like now, COVID and the crisis, mm -hmm. and you take all these zigzag paths. I mean, even my studies, um, my father studied uh, languages at Oxford, and okay. he insisted that I do sciences. So <laughs> I ended up doing a science degree. Why was that? Do you think he was allergic to he, the things he's he seeing said, in his sector? He said, you can't make money studying yeah, the right. arts. <laughs> I tried it, yeah. <laughs> he, um, he, he, yeah. Uh, so he pushed us, us into sciences and, and that kind of thing. So I did my first degree. And did that work for you? Obviously, you haven't <laughs> ended up in that space, but it, it sounds like maybe it gave you some mental frameworks. Uh... It gave me discipline. Mm -hmm. And it also, as, uh, you know, as in life, it gave me a network of friends mm -hmm. and people that became friends for life. Um, so in terms of the exposure on human side of it of course mm. it, it, it i could have been studying anything but i was studying sciences i met in fact all my friends were in other faculties they weren't <laughs> they were in the arts so um yeah so and then i kind of came into my own self i i kind mm. of found out who i was i think or however one does that and i wanted to do people people stuff i wanted to mm. go, go into tourism and hotels and that kind of thing and it, being in the caribbean of course it was kind of a thing that you could aspire tourism to. is is yeah. a core economic yeah. driver yeah. Yeah. but so you mentioned you you kind of worked out who you were how a uh, big question existential question but can yeah. you remember the process of like i guess the increments of doing that i don't know if i can put my finger on it but it was a transition it was it it was a feeling of being at sea at loss maybe in the, in the in the wrong place and then finding comfort level and i go back mm -hmm. to friendships and networks and 
In fact, uh, one of the key things that made me find myself was discovering theater and arts. And I mm -hmm. found a family. I found a niche. I mean, I was a, a young gay man growing up in a very straight society right. uh, with, <laughs> believe it or not, straight parents. So, <laughs> you know, there weren't role models. There, there, there was, uh, as I discovered later in life, really, shame which I didn't even recognize at the, at the time. So yeah. there were a lot of things that were inhibiting me being myself, whatever that was. Um, and ironically, or, or truthfully, theater and being in a, in a safe company of people that I didn't need to have my guard up allowed me to discover who I was creatively, intellectually, in terms of my mm -hmm. personality, yeah. So I think, and that I think that's it. it's exactly what we're aiming for with this concept of belonging is yeah. that you found yeah. your different people say it in different ways. You found your yeah. tribe, you found I your found home, you family. found your family. Yeah. 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 And, and the instincts that leads you to find that tribe, I think can be very strong as an undercurrent. There's a yes. gravitational pull. And towards. you don't understand it. That's why when you, when you asked, you know, what were, what were the stages? What have been increments? It, 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 I didn't think about it, but I gravitated towards people and yeah. industry and then felt comfortable. So maybe a and lesson to be learned for people out. to relax and just be aware. Yeah, and follow, follow, follow the instinct. gut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so considering that you, you had that experience of belonging, and I believe you, you still probably have that sense of that, <laughs> Uh, you know, from a practical day-to-day -day perspective, as well as the nostalgia, you know what it feels like to belong yeah. somewhere, yes. to be amongst yeah. your people. Yeah. Yeah. And so how has that worked in terms of you moving forward of what you've tried to create in a workplace belonging sense uh, in the, the various operations that you've, you've fallen into since then? Yeah, um, I wasn't aware of, I can safely say I wasn't aware of being other because mm. There was, a, <laughs> there was a certain arrogance about growing up in the Caribbean with people of different races and backgrounds and cultures. And I thought that I, I understood and I thought that I could fit in anyway. So there was that initial, the world's my oyster. I really, it isn't really different. But it is in many ways because coming from the culture that I did, uh, of mixed religions and races, um, as there are pockets all over the world, um, there is one difference, is that we have a unifying language, way of expression, and we have an overriding West Indian culture, mm -hmm. despite whatever racial genetic uh, background. So I, I always tell the story of Yes, you might be Muslim, you might be Hindu, you might be Christian, you might be Roman people, but we all are jumping up in the street at carnival, drinking rum and yeah. laughing. <laughs> and we sat next to each other at school. And my cousin is married to your sister. And it's an Indian person marrying a black person or Chinese person or white person. And we all sound the same. But coming from that to mono-ethnic cultures was, was the culture shock for me. Mm. And yeah, taught me some lessons in terms of, okay, yes, there are some differences, but they're all manufactured. They're mm. all manufactured by the various cultures, I think. Mm. And when you say mono-ethnic, tell us how you moved. Did you go straight from Trinidad, Tobago to Austria or what, what was the pathway then? I, well, I grew up in, in London and then mm -hmm. we moved back to the Caribbean um, and then I moved, I moved to London uh, for a short while and then went to Austria. Mm. Uh, of course, London and England is, it was a, trans a lovely transition <laughs> before I went to, to Salzburg. Again, I was in a kind of cocoon of an international school. And although I had to learn German and mix, there were people from all over the world. <laughs> Another story that I tell is that I'm in this class of international students, then they all look Caribbean. They were Chinese mixed with white, with Indian, with black. And one day I'm in class and I'm speaking to my Austrian teacher and she is very traditional. She's very Austrian. She looks Austrian. She sounds Austrian. 
She was a former Miss Austria. So, so in, in the Miss World. To me. Yeah. And I say, you know, everybody in this class could be from the Caribbean. And she puts her hands to her chest on her, uh, with her pearls around her neck and says, even me? Which said it all because she didn't think that there could be a white Caribbean, a white uh, African person, mm. you know. So that kind of said it. Uh, and yes, I did feel when we went out into the Austrian nightlife and theaters and clubs and so on, there, there, there was not an acceptance. You know, mm. I did notice that <laughs> be it a positive thing or negative, people did look at me when I walked in to a room, mm. which I expected anyway because I'm wonderful, but I didn't expect it in terms of who is this stranger, you know? Yeah, here's, here's someone new and, and uh, who we weren't yeah. expecting in our environment. Yeah. yeah, and it sounds like, I mean, so many things there. You had a, a sense of, um, you had this sense of belonging yes. because you, yeah. you're in your you're in your tribe, you're with people yeah. who you feel confident with. And yeah. so it kind of creates a, um, an armor, so to speak, yes, to does. be able to go yeah. out and say, well, it's not going to yeah. hurt me because here I have my, my backup. And I like what you're explaining as well with regards to things like food and drink, <laughs> things like family, you know, as we get intertwined and we have relational aspects together. And the fact that you have these cultural elements that bind you as opposed to just you know the nominal aspects of, yes. of dna so to speak yeah. so yeah. so yeah and so how does that come into workplace if you think about some of the dni initiatives that you've struck up what what have you been doing on the ground in the teams that you've been in to to explore and to create that sense of shared customs shared behaviors together and that sense of belonging for your own teams there's only one thing one can do and that is be excellent, be yourself, be mm. an example to somebody looking at you from the outside who has judged you. That might be your gender, your sexuality. The obvious one is color mm. or race. And let them see you as a friend, a colleague, and a, 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 a great manager, and let that be the example because you cannot do anything else you, mm. you if if you if you, you can attempt to change behaviors you can attempt to make people aware but oh, it is only incrementally by others meeting others and seeing themselves as human colleagues friends somebody having a cup of tea loving the same kind of biscuits maybe drinking to excess and taking a cab home and not turning up for work the next day together. Those things can bring people together. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also going to say that there are people in this world who <laughs> will never make that step because they are entrenched in some kind of stereotype uh, that very painful for them to exist in, you know, um, to constantly not like somebody just because of a thing, their color, their race, the food they eat, their accent, or the fact that they're not like you. Um, and you've got to actively detach from that yourself, otherwise it really takes you into a spin. I'm not saying I'm Buddha-like and God-like. I, 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 I've obviously been in tailspins. I've obviously not liked people because of the way they've treated me. But with time and perspective and just being myself, I mean, I, I, you know, just being myself, I guess, you know. Your audio is a bit for me. Your, yeah. I, I, Again, it's there's a lot of reverb coming through. Wi Fi and my internet. Um, am I coming through clearly? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm here, you know. <laughs> okay. So, just as you were speaking about, you know, your your personal um, 
uh, efforts to yeah. make sure that you're building relationships and that people are seeing each other as human, it absolutely makes sense to me. I think mm -hmm. when you have a friend or you have a family member, it becomes very real. It doesn't become yeah. so abstract as to who, yeah. who, who or what it is that you're yeah. um, against. Yeah. So when you look at that from the workplace perspective, I believe from your operations and from your management experience, you've been involved in various DNI workshops and um, and and attempts to sort of more institutionalize this. Take the take what you feel and you see work and try to build policy around it. Yeah. What do you see works or doesn't work when you try to build that in as a business formality? It's a very difficult thing to make work. I, I'm not sure I can identify the things that make it work, but maybe the things that are stumbling blocks. And it is, it is because it's, it's organized. It is because it is now policy. It is because it's now an agenda that people become resistant. Because in my experience, when I have met people in the workplace and we've all been told that we are going to the courses, there are such a varied reactions. Uh, some people think, but I'm friends with you. Some of my friends are black. What are you talking about? I, I don't have a problem with diversity and in inclusion on the ground. And that may be true. Mm -hmm. um, there are other people that says, God, I just, it's just because of a lot of you brown and black people in the workplace. And you know, they're just, just all political correctness and it's just gone too far. You know, and I'm not going to sit down here and basically told you are racist or oh, that's that, that, that's what most people think. But of course, diversity mm -hmm. means everything else. You know, people of different genders and uh, orientation and so on. But they, they, they hook on onto something. I'm not. Why are you telling me all of this? I don't need all of this. So I, I've, I've been in, in, in various situations where I've seen and heard the reaction. One most recent one, which was heartfelt from somebody who genuinely believed because the organization had a lot of different cultures and people got along that the problem had been solved. But it's much bigger than that. It's, mm. it's, it's about the gatekeepers and the people who live in the castle of their skins and their own privilege. And when they, when they, when they are allowing people into organizations, are they seeing clearly? Are mm -hmm. they seeing the whole picture? And we all have it. I mean, we all have our privilege and I've had to overcome that myself in terms of recruitment and in terms mm -hmm. of managing people and, and not being judgmental because uh, you know, of who I am. So mm. I can understand it. If as a brown person, I have my privilege and I have my myopia, far less somebody who's maybe not as exposed as me or, or not met people from different cultures, you know. As we were saying before, it's so easy, you're in your tribe. You want a comfort level. I, yeah. want, I want, Alex, I want you to be in, in my gang. I want you to work for me because you know what? We get on, we understand each other. Everything is yeah. shortcut and we can go and have a drink and all will be well. But you've got, I'm sorry to go no, on here. But yeah. I'm totally, I completely agree. And, yeah. and you just made me think that potentially if there is, um, we're, we're working towards, uh, you know, real genuine inclusion, making sure yeah. that people have yeah. voice, get recruited, as you said, like in the first word. place. Genuine yeah. inclusion. But then is there a downside to having so much belonging <laughs> yeah. when you, when you, if we, if, fantasize about having achieved inclusion yeah. um, and in the future everybody belongs what is the consequence of that do we stop thinking differently do we stop challenging ourselves do we stop being edgy on these these points so I, I'm wondering um I guess the, where, where we're headed <laughs> which which I uh, only think is a good thing but just exploring it from all angles <laughs> I, I think that in terms of the human animal there will be always people that belong and don't belong there will always be tribes there have been tribes mm. but our challenge as you rightly identified is to constantly keep asking ourselves those questions to be on the alert 
of our privilege. As I said, our privilege is on a spectrum. I mean, my privilege is, is very little compared maybe to um, Amazon. The queen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, but I'm still, I, 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 I still have it. And it's that constant asking. Companies always want to get the best people, the most skilled people, the most experienced people, and they go far and wide to look for these people. So yes, they have the ethos, but there is a blind spot uh, which they have to, to, to really challenge themselves about. For instance, as a good example, when organizations are trying to reach out to new audiences, I just love this euphemism, all of a sudden they find people who represent those new audiences. And especially in learning and interpretation uh, departments in museums and uh, um, so on. Uh, a lot of young people of color, different backgrounds, different religions are hired as experts to come in to be the face of a whole new drive to bring in new audiences. So organizations are very aware that there are others. Mm. Um, and, but they see others in a niche. They see them as bait to bring, to bring new audiences in, but they don't see mm. them as colleagues. Mm. And you know, that has been something that, is, that I've noticed a lot, especially in museums and galleries. That, that is I've interesting. Done. And so in that sense, do you see your colleague groups representing the public to which they serve and, and work with? Do you see a, a, a representation that's, um, symmetrical with the people that they're actually delivering no, to? Or? No, no I, yeah. I don't think any, anybody who's worked in, in the industry that uh, I work in can safely say that. I mean, mm. not, not at all. As I said, a specialist, as niche, as representing a market when you need somebody, but not, it, not as gatekeepers, not, not in, mm. as people in uh, positions of power. Mm, and decision influence. making. Mm, yeah. Okay. And so the arts, with that in mind, it is this huge opportunity um, because there's, there's community dialogue, there is, you know, there's, there's storytelling, as you've mentioned, um, you know, in, in the past conversations that we've had. And you've shared, I guess, some examples of where the arts themselves, I guess, the product that's being produced by your industry does have a broader repercussion. You had a great example of the, the arrival stories uh, in the uh, transport underground. Could you share, share a little bit of that okay. story with us? Oh, yeah. that, 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 that. It was a eureka moment for me as well. So um, we are researching and doing the operations for the Clapham South tunnels in South London, which uh, were created for people hiding from bombs in the Blitz. Um, and uh, I found out that they were also dormitories and used for people who didn't have anywhere to stay at various times. So the wind rush, the, the boat that was coming um, to uh, England from Australia went via the Caribbean and the owner of the boat decided that he didn't want it to come back empty. So he sold berths on it at discount and it went to Jamaica and he had about 200 people on, on the boat. And when they arrived here, uh, some of them didn't have anywhere to stay. So they were housed in those tunnels that were used during the Blitz, which had been used as dormitories temporarily. And that was in South London. And the nearest places that they could get jobs was in South London, in Brixton. And therefore that became the, the germ of the West Indian community. Uh, settling in London and which has led to this cosmopolitan part of London which is was predominantly West Indian by accident so yeah yeah fantastic and so this is a this is a way that your industry is able to showcase for other yes. people where their heritage has come from yeah. maybe the the jagged journeys that we yes. all take around the world yes. and, and and represent well, what another thing which 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 is was sharply uh, exemplified by that is there were pictures of these men in their jackets in their shirts with fedora hats holding their passports which were British citizens mm. you know they weren't immigrants because people believed yeah. that they just washed up <laughs> on the shore literally but these were 
citizens, some of them actually fought in the war. And when they went back to the Caribbean, because of the depression, they couldn't find jobs. So they came back to what was their mother country, you know? Mm -hmm. So again, a lesson to be learned uh, in terms of these were citizens. Yeah, know? absolutely. And yeah, it's uh, that's a really absolutely good call out. My history fails me sometimes. In terms <laughs> of, well, co colonization, I guess, is the, <laughs> it comes back to thing. a lot of, exactly, a lot of our, a lot of our, personal histories and workplaces have been, you know, uh, I guess, impacted by these decisions that are three, four, five hundred years yes. old. So it's, yeah. um, it's an interesting reminder. Yeah. So I think that's a really nice segue because you, you did mention the Caribbean to bring in uh, the, the initiative that you wanted to showcase today, uh -huh. Necessary Art. Yes. So I looked at their website. I know they promote social justice through the arts and they're yeah. running both youth and adult programs uh, yeah. in the arts in Trinidad, Tobago, yeah. Kenya and the UAE. So yes. can you share with this, like, what, what do you find compelling about what they're doing? Well, as I said before, the theatre and the arts opened up a whole new world for me. And I think that kind of exposure for young people is invaluable. It's not only the, the, the skill or the trade or their particular uh, uh, skill that they're, they're learning, but it's also working with people, networking, meeting all kinds of different people. And kind of falls into my two pet things, which are training and theatre. Mm -hmm. So, and I know um, my friend Naima, who actually created this uh, uh, program in the Caribbean and in UAE, um, as well as Kenya, and a lot of friends who are theatre practitioners and in the arts, who are friends and colleagues, volunteer to go to these various places. To mm -hmm. help. Yeah. So, Fantastic. Yeah. Have you been yourself or what's on your I have been horizon? to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So I've seen a program there and I've been, of course, to UAE as well. Uh, and uh, seeing the program there, yes. Wonderful. We'll, we'll put the, the URL in the show notes, great. absolutely. It's always Thank great to so hear about grassroots work. Yeah. Um, so with that in mind, you did mention training as being yes. something that you're personally compelled by. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? What's your, um, your, your typical involvement in a training sense? Well, I am usually involved in the recruitment first mm -hmm. of all, um, and I have created new departments and visitor experience teams uh, at the Victorian Albert Museum when we opened the new British galleries uh, there and at the South Bank when it reopened. So, yeah, so it was an it, integral part of team forming, that mm -hmm. whole bonding in terms of a team getting together and understanding how they're operating. And I love, love the challenge of putting together operational procedures and training. And, well, I like the center stage, so that isn't a very difficult <laughs> one to understand. But, but also, like, I want people to succeed. I want them to have knowledge. I want them to be able to do a good job and enjoy the job that they're doing. So it's, a, it's, it's yeah, a lot of stuff to put together. But, yeah. I'm, I'm losing you a bit there with 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 Still, I still. Okay. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just keep speaking until Sorry. you tell me that. Uh, okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah. So, with the training that you've been doing, it sounds like you are involved in the design, the delivery, yeah. which is where yeah. you get this opportunity to be on center stage. Yeah. So, can you tell us, like, what are some of the the processes that you go through, and and what do you see makes really excellent training in the space that you're in? Okay, first of all, I need to know my product. I need to know exactly the operations. And, and usually I have been in, a very, in very fortunate positions of being uh, in organizations that were either reopening or starting something new. So I learned the, the ops myself. I understood the health and safety uh, RAMs. 
So I was, I'm able to incorporate all of that into the training from first hand. Then I have learned along, along the way. I've, I was very prescriptive in my training when I was very telling everybody what to do. But of course, you learn that people have different learning styles mm -hmm. and you have to incorporate all kinds of different uh, ways of getting your point across. A mm -hmm. lot of people like paper and documents. I'm one of them. And others would love visual things or hands-on. They prefer to be told, okay, this is how we do it. Step one, two, three. Here's the handout, by the way. Others want the handout before. They want explanation and then are able to do it. But also, I, I enjoyed that process of discovering who uh, uses what style and how they're responding and, mm -hmm. yeah, and getting that kind of feedback. And it's, mm. and, it's, and it's developed over the years in terms of my style of, of, of delivering. Uh, a, bit more, yeah. a bit more fluid. Yes. And so have you ever applied that, that kind of design thinking, understand your products, take on the, the kind of, I guess, the messiness of yes. working out what works and what doesn't. Have you applied that in, in your own work to some of these diversity and inclusion initiatives? Have you been the receiver of the training or the designer of the training? I have been the receiver of the training. We mm -hmm. were in the process of actually designing training uh, when uh, COVID uh, stopped us in March, mm -hmm. but that was going to be our next step. We had done our um, initial work and we were defining what it meant in the workplace and getting feedback from staff mm -hmm. and we're just about to, to launch that that, that process of trying okay. to get that concept of behavior or be trying to change people's behaviors and the way they looked at each other. So mm -hmm. we would just started that whole process there, which was, and it was yeah. thwarted. And so yeah. did you have any insights about what you thought was really going to have that impact on behavior? Any elements of the training that you were expecting to, to have results? I had kind of internalized how I was going to actually get this across to the working mm -hmm. group before we got out there. And I wanted us to be real. I didn't want us to be pedantic. I didn't want us to use management speak. I mm -hmm. didn't want us to create the impression that everybody didn't understand what it was about. I didn't want to create any barriers. I wanted us to speak in real language to, to, to people's concerns mm -hmm. and make people aware, as we've, we've kind of touched on it before, and to be aware that it's not, it's not a, a battle that you win and you sit back and you relax. It is something that you need to be aware of all, the time, all your choices and have a conversation with yourself uh, constantly and understand what privilege is. That whole concept of privilege isn't just because you're wealthy or well-placed. Uh, it is, it, we all have it. And mm -hmm. that kind of sense of we understand the world, we know who we are, and the, that's the way it is. Not mm -hmm. really getting that people, other people think differently, you know, mm. and come from different places, yeah. So you strip back the management speak, you strip yeah. back the corporatees, and you have real conversations yeah. with people, which is yeah. fantastic. And then as you're, you're saying here and previously, that actually hopefully gets to a real core kernel that can be quite raw in people yes. because you're yes. peeling back yeah. their, their defences. You know, yeah. They've obviously put these yeah. shields up of, um, of ignorance and privilege yeah. to, for a reason. They're protecting something, yeah. an ego yeah. or you know, a sense of self. So how do you have these very very raw and maybe sometimes impolite, maybe sometimes ugly conversations in a workplace. Like if you unpack those things through training, what are you expecting to happen next? Yes, you're right. That is difficult. And we have had conversations like that. Uh, so we've had some conversations like that mm. in workshops before where every, we, have, we have said, this is a safe place. If you, if, you, if you want to discuss it, you're free to say how you feel about this. And this is how I found out about some people's attitudes thinking, mm. it doesn't really relate. We're all a happy bunch here. So 
so I understood that there were different views. There were different people were coming to this from, from different places and be allowed to say that. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, it might be raw, but I think the main thing that people need to go away with, okay, everybody, ha have you listened to the others and what they're saying? Some people are upset that they're here because they don't think that they need this or they don't recognize. But when you go back to your, your, your role or when you go back to your life, just pause and think mm -hmm. um, when next you're presented with a situation that says, let's hire, let's do, uh, let's create. And you think, I'm going to get David to do it. I'm going to get Mary to do it. And you just to pause and think, okay, how can you open it up a bit and get a different voice? Is there mm -hmm. a, an opinion that you haven't heard? Is there a creative person maybe that you haven't tapped? Ask somebody, talk to somebody else and get mm -hmm. as many opinions as possible. And, mm -hmm. and that's, I think, all you can ask for, uh, that people take pause and mm -hmm. ask themselves questions. Now, it might work every time. You, there might be budgets, there might be time constraints, and you think, I know Alex, she'll deliver, that job done, <laughs> thank you very much, you know, that's it. But yeah. just give people pause for thought. It's mm -hmm. a step, you know. So it sounds like the purpose of those workshops and those initiatives is not because there's a grand scheme to solve, <laughs> no. because there's actually quite deep-seated cultural yeah. and, yeah. you know, interpersonal aspects, yeah. but what you're really trying to do is just create awareness and, as yes. you said, create the moment to pause and be intentional yeah. with the yeah. actions. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and you, you sound like you're saying it's really an inflection point at the recruitment stage or at the project formation stage. That's when a lot of the key decisions are being yes. made yeah. that this, you know, I guess, you yes. know, yeah. bakes it in. But, 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 yeah, <laughs> technique, yeah understood yeah so i get the sense from all of this that we're really in a moment of kind of unfreeze at the moment there's uh there's a space for these conversations that maybe wasn't before because of the, the murder of george floyd you know kicked yeah. off several things that were already really existent in our societies all around the world and there's this discussion now about um what's happening in the street and how does that reflect in our workplaces how does it reflect in our families so because of this moment we've got a lot of hurt yeah. and we also have opportunity as well what is something that you might wish for to come out of this moment you know whether it's for your workplace or whether it's for a broader community what would you ideally like to see um, as as a result of of this current phase it's a it's a it's a bit of uh, uh, a thought about people valuing their human resource mm. what 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 seems to have happened with this crisis is that a lot of organizations have taken the opportunity to look at different financial models and disregard their human resource mm to a great extent. And what, what I would like to see is organizations appreciate their, their human resource, reconsider what, reconsider what has happened, learn, learn the lessons from what has happened here. There are lots of people um, who now are out of jobs uh, mm. because the, the whole culture, the whole climate has changed. But it, I think a lot of organizations have reacted in a brutal way, um, you know. And what I'd like to see is them have a little more uh, 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 consideration for their human resource mm -hmm. when, they start up, when they start up again, as we, all, we will. I mean, within a year, two years, we, we will start again and people will be at the center and people will recognize that organizations are not separate entities they're made up of people mm -hmm. who create your wealth mm -hmm. i like the word you use which is it's brutal yeah it is a um yeah. i think in terms of job loss this is where we yeah. have our social our social systems our health systems hitting yes. our economic yeah. system don't we and it's it really uh, hits home when it's an individual experience of, yeah. of a job loss so yeah. How do you think people come back from that? If, if, as you say, it's 
with one or it's two years down the track. I think we're all trying to project ourselves, wish ourselves yeah. forward at the moment. Yeah. Um, job loss can come with resentment. It can come with, you know, like definitely financial hardship. Yeah. So to be able to return, I assume that, you know, a whole, a whole group of people can't just pretend this didn't happen and that will come into our workplaces with some pain, with some angst, with maybe some even desperation by that stage. We don't know how we come through. So what do you imagine in terms of this, this beautiful population of human resources and when they do land again with employment in some new way, yeah. how, how does the sentiment carry forward into their workplaces through this experience that we've just had? It's going to be uh, an individual journey for each of us. We will have to tap into family. We will have to tap into friends. We will have to tap into counseling, help. Mm -hmm. It is that kind of journey. And you will have to come to terms with the brutality of it, the unfairness mm -hmm. of it, and where it sets you at. And then you have to be creative. You have to think, okay, this is the hand that I've been dealt with. What am I going to do with it? Sounds very philosophical, but no. I, I mean, I am going through that. I, mm. you know, my last day of work was the 31st of July and I have had to think about how, what do I do next? How, what livelihood do I have? What career do I have? How do I pick that up? Mm -hmm. um, and how, yes. So yeah, I've tapped into a lot of resources mm -hmm. and that will be our individual journeys back to the workplace. It might mm -hmm. be the same workplace. It mightn't be in the same way. Um, but yes, that's our challenge to find it because uh, mm -hmm. You, you talk about all this huge group of people that, but each of us has to find that path ourselves as yeah. an individual and, 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 and make the best of it. I'm being philosophical now, I, I, you know, but I've had dark, 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 dark moments, you know, of thinking, this is the edge, you know, mm. looking at the abyss, where, where, where do I go from here? Mm -hmm. And I've surprised myself. I'm pleased to hear it. <laughs> Have you seen, I mean, I'm, and I hope that you surprise yourself even more in the future. <laughs> Have you seen, if you look back at your past, and of course, you know, we, we started out by talking about the twists and turns and the directions that you've taken from banking to... <laughs> Luckily, yes. Luckily, I've paused and I've looked back with, with the support of people helping me to do that and thinking, okay, yeah, this happened five years ago. This happened 10 years ago. I'm here. It's different. Um, so yes, I have that experience that allows me to think it's going to be a new world. I don't know what it is. Hold on. <laughs> Mm -hmm. roller coaster be prepared as best as I can for this ride you know emotionally uh, physically I'm jogging and exercising my way around the park like I never did before yeah I two abs <laughs> that I never saw two abs well <laughs> done <laughs> yeah <laughs> and and Yes, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, 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 am, I am trying to walk a walk, you know? Yeah, um, one foot in front of the other. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to walk that walk. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm so grateful for the people that have been around me uh, 
wind up by, you know, accident, you know, some friend who exercises and said, let's do this and let's do the online hit class. And, and there am I doing it and incrementally and adding to my physical and emotional well-being at a time where what, what, what was it going to be? You know, all of us at one point were just in our own cocoons. We, we couldn't go out and we couldn't do anything, you know. Um, so, yeah, and friends calling in to say there's a job here. Why don't you think about that? Or, mm -hmm. Here's my flat. You can stay here. Things like that. So Fantastic. Uh, yeah, and this is the, so, it's the community that you've built around you. And we yeah. build those communities for the moments yeah. when we need them most, when we yeah. can pay into them and when we yeah. sometimes need to, 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 to you know, have an ask as well. Yeah. And I, I think it's so hard when we're in this moment. And this has been a prolonged moment, hasn't it? It's not like a moment in time. Yeah. It's been weeks and months uh, yeah. and, and leads up to this as well. But I think we all have this sense that we're, we're here right now in the, who knows if we're at rock bottom, not just for, you know, for any of us, we, we don't no. know what's to come, no. but we know we're in a deep hole yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but my, my sense, and this is why I was asking, is that when we've seen ourselves dig out of holes before, it gives us, you know, it doesn't make it fun, yeah. no. <laughs> but it gives us the resilience to say, I can do hard things yeah. and this too yeah. will pass. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the benefit of experience is, yeah. is knowing that everything moves forward. As you said, you, yeah. Yeah. if I put my one foot in front of the other, I will move forward. Yeah. Yeah. So I like this for you personally, because I think it is a nice reflection for, for us all oh. <laughs> so i can't say that i'm doing my hit workouts with you but i'm definitely you know <laughs> metaphorically putting one foot in front of the other <laughs> yeah. thank you thank you for sharing um so i'd like to wrap up the conversation with some rapid fire questions i feel like it's just a fun way to to finish off so i'm going to start a sentence you might actually enjoy this from your theater days <laughs> the, uh, where 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 psychology meets theater i don't know so I'm gonna, <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. I'm going to start the sentence and then if I can ask you to finish it with whatever you wish, something short or one word or just a brief answer and whatever comes to mind, you know, just first, first thoughts, hopefully Yikes. uncensored. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, ready? Yeah. Okay. A good career is? One that's fulfilling and satisfying. Fantastic. I want my 20 year old self to know that. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Yeah. Maybe we right now need to hear your 20 year old self <laughs> not, as well. Not in 2020. Not <laughs> no, in 2020. Yeah, no, exactly. 2021, wake me up. Oh, um, so on that note, I woke up this morning thinking about. This meeting and looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> I've enjoyed it. I hope you have. And my, the final question, my gift to the next guest is. Wow, have fun doing the interview. <laughs> have fun. I like it. Yeah. Thank you. I definitely will. I'm, I'm the beneficiary of all this yeah. collective wisdom and cultural yeah. wisdom. So I'll pass on your well wishes for fun. Great. So thank you, Vaughan. I've really enjoyed the conversation. It's, it's absolutely been my pleasure. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to chat. Yeah, thank you. So with that, everybody, thank you. The Real Work was hosted today by me, Alex Lamb, uh, and it wouldn't be possible without the contribution of our team here at Lantern Rouge. Production support is managed by Mark Hayes, and that's it for now. We'll see you at work. Thank you.